Hello everyone. I would like to welcome you all to today's uh, Q&A answer, a session on sensory processing difficulties. My name is uh, Fiona Farrell and I'm the consultant paediatric occupational therapist and the information that you would have um, received, that you'd have read, um, that was myself. So I'm delighted to be here today to uh, go through some of the questions that um, you've sent in and to hopefully um, answer those and hopefully give you some more reassurance. And if you do have any further questions um, at the end of the session, you can send them in because there will be another one after this. Um, so we're ready now to, to start. Okay, well, sensory processing um, is a term that really refers to the way the brain receives the messages from our senses about our body, about the world around us and about our environment and turns these messages within the brain into appropriate responses, both behavioral and uh, motor responses. Every day, as if we think of ourselves as adults, we have mature brains and we're effortlessly and constantly taking in information from both our outside world and our bodies. It helps us to learn, to work and to play. This information enters our body via our senses, as we know we have the, the seven senses, and travels, I like to refer to it like a fast train along the smooth train tracks up to the right parts of the brain where it's all processed and integrated, and that helps us to react appropriately. With the developing brain then for a child, there are critical connections that need to be developed during that critical brain period that helps that information travel to the brain like the fast smooth train on the smooth train tracks to the right parts of the brain. Development of these connections is vital to enable a smooth trip to the, to the right parts of the brain. Over the last uh, few years, there's been an explosion in the amount of children whose messages do not have a smooth trip to the brain. The train kind of gets stuck along the tracks, it goes too fast, it goes too slow, or it takes the wrong signal. The result is then that the brain is not able to make an appropriate uh, response, be it behavioral and motor response. And the result is then the increase in the um, learning and uh, behavioral difficulties. For the train tracks to be smooth, the developing brain needs appropriate types of activities to help the process of sensory processing to occur. Sensory processing is a very normal part of brain development. We all use our senses to decode the world around us, to make sense of the world around us, to help us successfully participate and engage in our everyday activities, to interact with peers, really whatever we do throughout the day. We also all need to integrate our senses constantly throughout the day to help us with our daily activities. And if I use an example here, if we think maybe if you're self in the preschool environment, you're in the classroom, you maybe have about a 10 minute slot in the middle of the day, if you're lucky, um, to maybe do some notes. And you're sitting on a small chair at the table. There's maybe a, a group in the corner. It's maybe like a music group or story time. There's a few children running around. They're bumping into you. They're bumping against you. There's another class is outside uh, playing in, in the playground. OK, so for you, your main task there is really to, to write your notes. You'll be able to sit upright in, on the small a, the chair at the, a small table and to concentrate, to focus, just to do your notes. OK, so with your mature brain, you're able to integrate all that information that's coming via your senses OK, up to the brain. The brain then is able to filter out what it doesn't need, i.e. you don't focus on, for example, the young child bumping against you. You don't focus on what is going on outside, but you are able to focus on what's going on, um, i.e. doing your notes at the small table. When tasks become frustrating for our young children, it may be that they actually have difficulty actually organizing and using all that information appropriately from their senses. We are constantly all taking in sensory information and using that. Some of us would be better maybe in some areas, maybe the auditory sense or the tactile sense or the proprioceptive sense. And some of us as well will have sensitivities in some areas. For example, I myself, I hate the roller coaster rides. My vestibular system would be more sensitive than my other areas. However, the key is here, it doesn't impact on my ability to function. And it's when our sensory systems and for our children, when it begins to impact on their ability to function throughout the day, that's when we refer then to our, our difficulties with sensory processing. Often for our children, 
who have difficulty processing and organizing sensory information, the behaviors can often be misinterpreted. It may be misinterpreted being malicious, being bold, being lazy, not interested in the activity, or they just want to be on their own. Or the other typical can be, that, oh, they'll grow out of their behaviors. But we need to start looking at why, at when we see those behaviors or the motor responses, why is it actually happening? Okay, so using both US and UK statistics, there aren't so many for Ireland. There's approximately five to 16% of school aged children who are, are diagnosed with sensory processing difficulties. However, for a lot of children, their difficulties go unrecognized until actually they are in the school system, the formal school system, where they begin to struggle with more of the academic type of tasks. For example, being able to sit and concentrate and focus on the work. However, that can still be misinterpreted as purely behavior where there may be underlying sensory difficulties, sens sensory sensitivities um, happening. PE activities, where it involves maybe the gross motor skills um, and fine motor skills, maybe being a, for example, a using a bat to hit a ball, that kind of example, riding a bicycle, writing tasks, um, and their daily tasks, being able to maybe, you know, tie their shoelaces, get on their trousers, those kind of things. Another reason that the sensory processing can be overlooked is that it can be part of a wider diagnosis. It often um, is part of the, both our autism or dyspraxia um, and ADHD. So that can be why sometimes it can be overlooked um, as well. Okay, well, sensory processing is actually an ongoing um, process. There's no kind of start and, and end to it. Um, however, it matures with, with the brain developing. It actually starts in utero. When we think of the, the last uh, trimester of pregnancy, the fetus is actually developing rapidly. And those neural connections between the sensory organs and the different brain regions associated with sensory processing are developing. If we think of the sense of touch, it's actually the very first sense uh, to form. And we know from a uh, babies, infants that are born premature, that they can actually detect the, the sense of, of touch. Both the uh, smell and taste also develop a uh, before birth. But what is key is, is that the, as we go, go into infancy, into the toddler years and into the preschool years, that their body has the appropriate types of activities that support the ongoing development um, of sensory processing along with the brain development. Around about the age of eight, that's usually whenever kind of that the, the brain development is kind of optimized. And in our own services, as example, occupational therapy, that's whenever we begin to then look at more remedial type activities. Whereas we think of that brain development, I mean, as you probably you would be aware, those first three years uh, where 90% of the brain development actually occurs, that is when it's really key to get all those um, connections uh, for that brain development or for the sensory processing. Okay, well, firstly, uh, it, it's not an illness. Uh, we think of ourselves as, as adults. We all have sensory sensitivities. I, I used my own example of, of the, um, the, the fast rides and the, the playgrounds, etc. And you may, as an adult, be more aware of that whenever you're overtired. You know, you may find you become overwhelmed much more quickly um, and you might have outbursts much more quickly. Um, and that's just an example of, of us as with mature brains. However, as I said earlier, these sensitivities don't tend to impact on our function. For most of our children then who, who are possibly struggling with sensory processing difficulties that are impacting on their function, a lot of them haven't been given those opportunities during that critical brain development period to engage in the types of activities that are needed to develop the critical connections to ensure that smooth train trip up to the brain. Uh, whenever the information enters the sensory receptors to the appropriate regions of the brain to process, organize, which then enables appropriate behavioral and motor responses. In terms of diagnosis, uh, it is actually referred to in the diagnostic classification of mental health and developmental disorder of infancy and early childhood as a regulatory disorder of sensory processing 2005. Uh, so it is actually um, classified in, in that. And more recently, 
researchers at the University of California using MRI scans have been able to detect abnormalities in the brain structure of children with sensory processing um, difficulties. Uh, so, and whenever we talk about sensory process, as, as any of our uh, difficulties that impact on our, on our children, we, we tend not to refer to it as an illness, it's that the child is having difficulties in that area that's impacting on their function, but there's so much that we as adults um, can actually do to support those children, to help things get back on track or to help make things a little bit easier um, for them. So in Ireland and worldwide, the expert diagnosis for sensory process, and we, we still tend to refer to it as sensory processing difficulties as opposed to sensory processing um, disorder, uh, is via paediatric occupational therapy. However, sensory processing can be part of a bigger diagnostic picture when we talk about autism and um, ADHD, and that would actually be part of, then of the multidisciplinary team. So that would involve speech and language therapy and um, psychology, but when, when it's a, that initial uh, for sensory processing difficulties, yes, that will come through ourselves in paediatric occupational therapy, both in the HSC and also in private practice as well. However, within the preschool, your information is actually vital um, and it's critical to providing a holistic uh, picture of the child, their participation, participation and engagement in all areas of the preschool. We think of the environment, with their peers, with the different tasks that they have to do, with their daily living tasks. And that holistic uh, picture helps give the OT really a history of the child's participation and engagement in their natural familiar environment. In the preschool, you have a key role then in observing and documenting Rather than thinking maybe, and not as you would, but rather than thinking maybe the child is maybe not interested in activity, but maybe documenting the activity and then what the child actually maybe did. So if we think of some of our child, children maybe who um, have difficulty actually engaging with an activity and maybe tend to run a lot, just run, 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 run around the playground, but from the playground, but not actually engaging, well then that is what you actually uh, would be encouraged to document. So your role is kind of what I see it as a paediatric OT is, is really documenting your observations and your concerns and your strengths um, for the child as well. I often I just say to preschool practitioners as well, preschool teachers, is never feel it's a reflection of you or your preschool. Because I know from my many years as working as a paediatric OT, that often staff can feel, oh, well, if the child isn't um, succeeding, that maybe it's it's reflecting us or it's reflecting our preschool environment. Maybe we're doing something wrong or we're not doing something right or we're meant to do something else. And no, please, please don't ever think like that. By actually documenting and observing, uh, with that do documentation, with the observing, you're giving us key information that we might not have. Because remember, if they come into us in the clinic or if we come out to do a preschool visit, we're just getting a little snippet um, of, of once in a day, maybe. So your information is vital. It can be tricky though when you're actually speaking to parents because as, as you know, to a, for an onward referral to paediatric occupational therapy, you need the parent's consent. And that can be where it can get really, really tricky. Um, because as, as we know in our own services, you know, parents can not often be, oh, well, oh, sure, he's lazy. I'm sure he's the same at home. Sure, he'll grow out of it. And that can be the really tricky part. But it can maybe be useful to, to maybe explain to the parents that, you know, what you've, observed and what you've documented and it's maybe you know this is what you'd be expecting a child so for example if it's out in the playground and a uh, you'd be expecting them to maybe be able to climb up the climbing frame and come down the slide and uh, whereas maybe the child is just constantly running around and around and around will you document that and you can say that this is what you would actually expect the child to, to be able to do that and then you can also explain to the parent that really you, you want to maybe refer to paediatric occupational therapy because you just, you know, it'd be very beneficial to see is there a reason behind the behaviour that you're seeing um, with, the, with the child. And that can be very useful. It's also important to um, stress to the parent how important the skills that the child is actually developing, mastering and learning in the preschool environment is critical for their later school performance, that academic um, success. That really what they're, what they're engaging in now and what they're learning is actually the foundation for all those academic skills later um, in, in the school system. 
And as I said, you can expect parents to come back with that reply, oh, she's a grow out of it or um, she's lazy at home. And then you can lead into that by asking the parent, OK, well, you know, it, describe to me what, what kind of activities does he do at home? What kind of activities then you're saying he's lazy? So what would he not do uh, or what would he do different? So you can get a picture of the home environment um, as well as then for the, for the preschool environment as well. When you're uh, discussing it with parents, uh, it's you know, it is important not to be suggesting that there's anything wrong because that can then put a lot of fear in, into parents. It's also important not to use terms such as sensory processing difficulties and um, because that is where then the referral goes on worse to, I suppose, look to see are there any reasons um, that are explaining why the child is behaving or not behaving in, in the way that they are. It can be useful, though, to suggest that, you know, with advice, with tips, with maybe a different way of doing something or with a different set of activities and some strategies, that that can be sufficient to help get the child back on track. So they're developing all those connections that the brain actually needs to help set them up for academic um, success later.